Jesus said, do not fear, only believe. Please be seated. Before jumping in to my message this morning, I realized for those of you who were at the rector's forum this morning, I neglected to say one thing. I could not done all I had done had I not the support and courage given to me by my wife. I forgot to mention that. <laughs> as soon as we walked out and I looked at the picture, I'm like, Kelly, you dummy. Okay. <laughs> Today's gospel text is made up of two narratives combined into one story. You probably noticed that the reading that Father Jacob read was really long. That's because it is. There's no good way to separate these stories because, as we'll see, they're inseparably intertwined. Uh, 21 verses is a long gospel text, but as I was at the Provincial Assembly this week, I had a couple times where I could carve out time um, because unlike J.D., I'm introverted, and so... Working on my sermon was an excuse to just get away from people for a little bit. I was talking to J.D. about it. I'm like, this is a really long text. He said, take as much time as you want, Kelly. So he said, just don't take very long at the passing of the peace. So I'm kidding, okay? (laughs) In this extended reading, we have Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, whose daughter is at death's door. And it's something, having a loved one going through this, is something most people can relate to, whether a child, a spouse, or a parent. When someone you love is intimately close to you and near death, it's perfectly normal to have this sense of urgency inside. You want your loved one to have the very best help, and you want it now. If it's a hospital you want to get to, then you want to get there as fast as possible. And if it's God you're calling to, then... You want him to act now and restore the person to health and you back to your sanity. It's probably a familiar feeling to many of you. That's exactly how, why Jairus comes to Jesus with a sense of urgency. My little daughter is at the point of death, he says. Come, lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And Jesus went with him, the text says. A ruler of a synagogue is a lay person who took care of the administrative workings of the synagogue, somewhat like vestry members in our church. Jairus, in a state of desperation, seeking Jesus, a wandering wandering preacher, would have been humbling. Among the Jews, synagogues function like churches. They still do today. In fact, in Hebrew, the word for synagogue is Knesset, and it translates as house of assembly. Hearing it might sound familiar to you, Knesset. Today, the Knesset is a gathering of the legal body in Israel. It's similar to our Congress. You hear it a lot now in the news, as the Israeli Knesset has regular and often difficult gatherings since the October 6 massacre. It's very similar, that word Knesset, to the Greek word for church in the New Testament, ekklesia, literally, the called out ones. So when you put the ideas of these two words together from the beginning, God's people have been called out from the world to assemble. As the ecclesia, the church, that's what we're doing today. We're following God in that command. In the synagogue of the New Testament era, Jairus, at the beginning of every service, would have heard what's called the Shema. And it goes like this. You may be familiar with it. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. In his desperation, Jairus, seeking out Jesus, disregarding his own dignity as a synagogue leader, and he falls at the feet of Jesus, a homeless teacher, asking him to do what only the one God of Israel can do. Like with prayer for us or at the Eucharist, we kneel before God to acknowledge his presence as well as our need. Jairus is making an act of worship and petition. He is treating Jesus in a way that a Jew should only treat the one God of Israel, Yahweh. We can confidently assume that Jairus has heard of the miracles of Jesus thus far. Evidence of this is in the fact that he asked Jesus to put his hands on his daughter, that she may be healed. This is why we lay hands on someone who petitions God with healing prayers. When we do this, we join in the ministry and in the power of Jesus as we pray for those who are sick. Now, Jesus healed a lot of ways. And at one time, he does spit and rubs it in dirt to heal somebody. I will never do that to you, I promise. (laughs) 
Jacob might, I never will. <laughs> but we do place oil on the sick as we pray for them, as the epistle of James instructs us to. Why do we place oil on you when we pray for you when you're ill? This is because our bishop, Bishop Chip, he's blessed that oil for that use. And he can trace his ordination to Archbishop Beach, our former archbishop now, who can trace his ordination back and back and back to the apostles and to Christ himself. The oil we anoint you with in praying for healing has a legacy that goes back to the disciples who wrote the gospels and the epistles and to our very Lord. That's part, to me at least, the beauty of Anglicanism. Our story and our traditions are they're rich treasures to the the church writ large. But back to Jairus. His act of worship and petitions to Jesus, those are rare in the Gospels. It's only by faith, a gift of God, as Paul tells us, that someone like Jairus could come to Jesus in faith. Jairus isn't coming to Jesus because Jesus is considered a healer. Israel had physicians. St. Luke, our patronage saint, was just one of those. And think about the lady who's going to Jesus. It says also the woman who was healed that she had spent all her money paying to be healed. Again, he comes to Jesus in worship and petition, asking as one who asks for what only the one God, the true God of Israel, can provide, his healing. Jairus now is Jesus' attention, and they're heading home to see his dying daughter. Church father, Peter Chrysologus, writing in the early 5th century, the early 400s, and I think this was important to share, noted that God understands the pain of parenting a sick child. God knows the pain of having a sick child, and this can translate to a sick spouse or, or somebody you love. Chrysologus writes, let us speak for a moment of the pains and anxieties which parents take upon themselves and endure impatience out of love and affection for their children. Here, surrounded by her family and by the sympathy and affection of her relations, a daughter lies upon her bed of suffering. She is fading in body. Her father's mind and spirit are worn with grief. She is suffering the inward pangs of her sickness. Her father, unwashed, unkempt, is absorbed wholly in sorrow. He suffers and endures before the eyes of the world. She is sinking into the quiet of death. But the love of parents goes on nevertheless. And whatever parents bestow upon their children, God, the parent of us all, will duly repay. He's saying that those who you love and lose in this life, if they are in Christ and you are in Christ, they will be returned to you. That is the hope of Christian faith and love. It's the very hope and the reason for the resurrection. Our text continues with an interruption, a story of a woman with a bleeding ailment that distracts Jesus from dealing with his first issue, Jairus' daughter. Her story, though intertwined with a dying girl, could be a sermon unto itself. What is important to note is that amid this distraction, Jesus heals this woman who suffered for 12 years. She spent all she had on doctors to forestall her death. Some of you know what it's like to see your family's resources depleted, paying deductibles, clinics, and hospitals in hopes of curing or comforting a sick loved one, maybe even one you've lost. And I know that you would likely do that again. Now she's still alive, though. Therefore, the expense was well spent. But now she has no more money. Then she touches Jesus' garments, and she's healed. And what does Jesus tell this woman? Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. This all happens right in front, right in the eyes of Jairus, who I believe we can assume with the sun drawing down and the day going by, he's more fixated on Jesus getting to his dying daughter. And we don't know what Jairus' thoughts were about the woman's healing taking place in front of him that moment. However, if my daughter were dying in our home despite that woman's healing, quite honestly, I would probably be angry. After all, Jairus did ask first. Although there is only a slight delay, it's still a delay, and death is at the door. 
love for his daughter sent him to Christ, for he realized that only Christ could help her. And yet Jesus did not reject that woman. All who come to him are welcome, period. Possibly that's why Jesus allowed the delay. Jesus will never reject anyone who turns to him in faith and asks for mercy. That is something that every believer and unbeliever needs to hear. It bears repeating over and over again. Jesus rejects no one who turns to him in faith, seeking mercy, just like he didn't reject the woman. But back to Jairus. He gets the worst news any parent can receive. And I know that some of you have been there. Men came from his house and told him his daughter was dead. The crushing news, so final. It's followed by some of the worst advice you can offer to a grieving father. Why bother the teacher anymore? How crushing and insensitive. Not only do they tell him the worst possible outcome, his daughter is dead. They tell him he has no hope. Why trouble the teacher any further? As if he was already a problem to Jesus. In my career, I had the opportunity on 27 occasions to do a death notification to a family. I know what those moments are like, the absolute horror of revealing that, that news to a family unexpectedly. And I've also had experience to this in combat when you learn about death and the finality of it and things must still move forward. When someone loses his life in the fight, we can't stop and grieve, which could lead to more death and even compromise the mission. Following it casually, there were t after we lose someone off on more than one occasion, I would have to take a soldier by the shoulders and say, I know he's dead. Or tell them, you need to get it together because we have to keep fighting. And on one occasion, I had a dear friend, Sergeant Major Kennedy, um, look at, after the death of a dear friend of mine, same operation, uh, lost his life. When I came in uh, to the operations tent, he saw me crying, which my wife can tell you is probably one of the five times somebody's heard me cry in my life. Um, he told me, Kelly, I know, but we have to get these guys out of the fight. There will be time to grieve later. And just a little aside here, and some of you might have experienced this, some of the worst things can be said at the death of a loved one or any time of serious loss. Some examples are, everything happens for a reason. Another is, I know how you feel. Or, imagine if you were this little girl's parent. She is in a better place. Can you imagine how Jairus would have felt with that advice? That's probably what he felt when he was told, leave the teacher alone, don't bother him anymore. Uh, in August here at St. Luke's, we launch our Colson Fellows program. The program's president is John Stone Street, an Anglican himself. Actually, he spoke at the Provincial Council last week. At his grandfather's funeral, someone said to his grandmother, you had so many wonderful years together. His grandmother replied, but I wanted more. When Jairus was told, why trouble the teacher any further, I imagine he wanted to reply, because I love my daughter. When Jesus spoke to the woman he healed, what did he call her? Back to her now. What did he call this woman when he healed her? He calls her daughter. And again, how did that woman receive her health? It was through faith. The same Spirit of God that called Jairus to seek out Jesus called that unnamed woman to seek faith given by God's Holy Spirit as well. When Jairus is told, your daughter is dead, why trouble the teacher any further? What does Jesus tell the stunned, empty, and grieving father? Do not fear, only believe. Jairus has had exercised faith when he came to Jesus in the confidence that he would save his daughter. After asking Jesus what happens, he sees a miracle. He had witnessed the woman's healing, which demonstrated the relationship between faith and the divine help that can come from Jesus alone. When Jesus asks him to believe that this child would live even as he prepares to walk into the house to see his daughter's body for the first time devoid of life. 
His daughter is now a cadaver. We have to put it in those terms. You have to call it what it is to know the power of grace that comes through Jesus Christ. Burial usually was on the day or death of the following morning. So those who were there knew she was dead. Jesus saw that the preparations had been made for the funeral. The minstrels and professional mourners were performing their duties as the first part of the mourning ceremony. Jairus had been away with Jesus. That means his family had to arrange for the little girl's burial ceremony in his absence. The wailing consisted of a choral or antiphonal song accompanied by hand clapping. Even the poorest man was required by common custom to hire a minimum of two flute players and one professional mourner in the event of his wife's death. And even though this was his daughter, probably the family who held the rank of synagogue ruler would be expected to hire many professional mourners for her ceremony. When Jesus comes to the house, he declares it necessary to remove the mourners from the girl's room. When Jesus said, the child is not dead but asleep, the funeral team laughed at him. The mourners were absolutely certain the girl was dead, and they responded to Jesus' words with scornful laughter. It only amplified the fact that wailing and tears could be exchanged so quickly for laughter. Because these people are professional mourners. They know their business. It also indicates how conventional and artificial these mourning customs had become, that they could turn the tears off and the laughs up on a dime. Jesus cast the scoffers outside, allowing only the parents of the girl and three of his disciples to accompany him. There before their eyes, they see that little girl. It's implied that Jesus wants silence, this might be from the rank unbelief of those who had ridiculed Jesus with their scornful laughter. It's clear throughout the Gospel that, of Mark that Jesus only secretly revealed that he was the Messiah. He was unwilling to make himself known to the raucous, unbelieving group that had gathered outside the house. When the child appeared in public, the facts will speak for themselves. The resurrection of this girl is both a deed of compassion and a pledge of the conquering power of Jesus over the forces of death and unbelief, in which the kingdom of God was disclosed as a saving reality. In deliverance from death, the salvation that Jesus brings finds its most pointed expression. Right in here in this gospel reading today, Jesus shows that he is indeed the Lord of life in healing that woman and the Lord of death in resurrecting this little girl. He also shows us compassion here. Note that he called the woman daughter. And he called the girl little girl, just as his, her father had called her my little daughter. We joke at times, and J.D. I do a lot, about poorly written worship songs, the Jesus and my boyfriend songs. You know, that's the wrong Jesus. For some, Jesus being God, he's too difficult to approach because as God, he knows what we've done and he knows what we left undone, as we say in our confession. But I believe I mentioned earlier that Jesus rejects no one who turns to him in faith, seeking mercy. Jesus shows us the heart of the Father and the way he talks to these people. He calls the woman daughter. And the daughter, and Jairus' daughter, he calls little girl. That is the love and the mercy of God towards his people. Brothers and sisters in Christ, that's how God sees you. He calls you sons. He calls you daughters. For younger folks, he calls you little girls and little boys with the absolute love of a parent. Jesus tells the dead girl, Talitha kumi, little girl, I say to you, arise. It's one of the few times in the New Testament the Aramic language, the language that Jesus would have spoken comes forward. Can you imagine the frightening shock and overwhelming joy that Jairus experienced at that moment when his little daughter came back to life? How about his wife, moms out there? Can you imagine the little girl herself? What had she experienced during that time? The three apostles who were brought in to watch the honor to see what's taking place. Or what about the mourners outside? What do you think they thought? Or how about 
the guy who told Jairus to quit bothering Jesus. I won't say any names, I don't want to call anybody out, but many of you are aware of God's mercy to some in our own congregation who've been given what appeared to be a hopeless diagnosis. We've had this with members of all ages in this congregation, but we believe in the healing hand of God. We believe also that God works through medicine and God works through medical teams, and that's wonderful. And we trust our lives, our souls, and our bodies to God, and we've seen many of these people healed. That's why our prayer team meets each week to call our sick out by name, those who are suffering also. We do this because we believe our Lord is our healer. We need to look at this miracle and take its meaning to heart. Unless we live, each one of us, until judgment day, we too will all die. That's everybody to your left, right, front, around you. We all will die. Loved ones, acquaintances, and past generations have all gone that way. But our text today and the gospel as a whole is a reminder that death is not the end. The eternal Son of God has conquered death, not only for that woman and that little girl, but also for those whom the Holy Spirit has regenerated to new life in Christ. Our natural death, the first death, is a result of our sin. We all have to walk through that. But the Lord has paid for our sins, and those who put their faith in Jesus are spared the second death, what we know as eternal damnation. He died our death and has promised to raise us up again on the last day. You all are going to see each other again, so get used to it. This is what the Apostles' Creed means. I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Our catechism explains this. When the risen Lord returns to judge the earth, he will raise all the dead to bodily life. The wicked will then receive eternal condemnation and the righteous eternal life in the glory of God. It's interesting. Another time the gospel carries forth the Aramaic is at the cross. There Jesus cries, Lama, Lama, Sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I imagine at the moment that Jairus heard his daughter was dead, he felt that. And I imagine some of you at the loss of someone you love have felt that as well. Here we have a foreshadow of why Jesus was forsaken. It was done in the hope of the resurrection from the dead. The little girl and those who've gone to the grave before us and for ourselves, our death too will be but a sleep. Awakening from death through his word of power, we shall live with Jesus forever. And remember, Christ did not do this in secret. There were five witnesses to what happened that day and everybody else around them, three of whom were his disciples who later went out and proclaimed him as Lord of life. This miracle proclaims his deity, Jesus is God, and assures us of our salvation. And when the, that great day comes, you guess who you're going to see face to face? You're going to see Jesus face to face the very one who was in the house that day, saying Talitha Kumi. Then, like Jairus, his wife, and the little girl, the three apostles who were called to watch, the mourners outside, and the man who told Jairus to quit bothering Jesus. Then, like them, we too, we will respond with frightening shock and overwhelming joy at the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do not fear, only believe. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.